laughing like, yeah, right. I got to tell you, this morning was beautiful. It was really beautiful. How many are glad that fog, at least today, it wasn't here? I mean, that stuff was nasty. I grew up in southern Oregon, and we used to get fog like that all the time in the winter time, and it was just horrible, and uh, it lasted all day. Uh, so fortunately, it only lasts about half a day here, but still, it was just nasty fog and all of that. It's hard to see, hard to drive. This morning I woke up and I was getting ready to do my devotion, got my coffee and fed all the critters and watered the dog and all that kind of thing. And uh, I looked out the window and this is what I saw. Post that. Can you put that up, that picture? This is what I saw out my, out my back door this morning. So that's the sun rising, and that's the moon above the fellowship hall. Isn't that beautiful? Just uh, talks about the glory of God, that picture. I mean, it's just wonderful. And today we're going to talk about light in the darkness. And as the sun was coming up, I was thinking about that. thinking, wow, This really kind of would work today. And so I, I put it on the computer up there so that you could see it too. I'm kind of proud of it too, so... I'm sorry if I'm getting kind of, you know, to amplify. Yeah, maybe. Do they take uh, old guys? No, okay. Okay, anyway, so uh, we don't like darkness. I mean, some people like darkness, but it depends on the reason for that. <clears throat> In the darkness, how many of us have... You've, you've busted a shin, or you've tripped over something, or you stepped on a Lego, or you stepped in a hole and twisted your ankle. I told you I was going to use it. This guy came in. He was a walking with crutches example of what exactly what I'm talking about today. Well, I could still find some, though. You give me a field and bare feet, and I'd find them for you. So... Oh, yeah, that, now that happened to me once, too, where I just, like, anyway, we're not going there. But darkness in the Bible signifies a lack of direction. It signifies a lack of wisdom, knowledge, spiritual relationship with God. That's what darkness represents. But light, on the other hand, represents all the opposite of that. And Jesus, in our text this morning, we're going to start with uh, chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus starts by proclaiming, I am the light of the world. During the Jewish Sabbath and festivals, light is a very important symbol of God's blessing and God's presence. Candles are always lit. And as we know, uh, in verse, or excuse me, in chapter 7 and now into chapter 8, the Feast of the Tabernacles were happening, and now it's over, and Jesus is still there teaching in the temple courts and the area of the temple in different places. And uh, light, of course, candles were lit and light was had and they were remembering God leading them in the wilderness by the pillar of fire. And what that meant was God's presence was with them. That's what that was all about. So this morning we're going to continue on in our study of John and take a look at this section here where the Pharisees, once again, were <clears throat> disputing the claims of the Lord. So let's look at, well, let's, let's start by prayer. Let's pray. In fact, you know, some churches do this. I wonder if we would do this. Would you stand with me in honor of the Lord? We're going to pray. We'll read God's Word. It's not the book that's important, it's... It's the word, the living word. So God, we give you praise, we give you honor this morning as we prepare our hearts to receive from your eternal word. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would move within us. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And verse 12. 
Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> That's where we're going to start. More than that, but uh, I just wanted to start with that. So this is the second of the seven I am statements in the book of John. I think I covered this a couple of years ago, the I am statements of John. And this is number two. Now, why is this significant? Why is it significant when Jesus says, I am the light of the world? Well, you notice that I am there. He is using the, the I am, the uh, divine name of God, applying it to himself. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The I am statements found in, in the Gospel of John, all the times when he used the divine name, referring to himself. Now, there's a lot of people in the world say, well, Jesus never claimed that he was God. You guys are just making more out of him than he really was. He was only a good teacher, and he was just a misunderstood guy. He never said he was God. He never said he was Messiah. I beg to differ. The Bible is clear. And these seven statements are... We're not lost on the Jews, I'll tell you that. Might be lost on us, but it wasn't lost on the Jews. And uh, so it, the first one, he said, I am the bread of life. And here he says, I am the light of the world, chapter 8. In chapter 10, he said, I am the door. And he also said, I am the good shepherd. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And in, in John chapter 14, he says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And finally, in John chapter 15, he says, I am the true vine. No more stumbling in the dark. Truth, wisdom, and clarity comes through the light of the world. Amen? Dr. Tom Constable, I don't know who that is, says, the light of life figure stands for what dispels the darkness of ignorance and death. Jesus was claiming that whoever believes in him will enjoy the light that comes from God's presence and produces life. This light metaphor was common throughout Israelites' history. And I was thinking about that, thinking about how uh, the, the Jews and, and in the Old Testament, which is the Jewish scriptures, what did they say about light, the light? And I found in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19 through chapter 9, verse 2, where they're talking, the, it, the prophet Isaiah is talking about the light of Messiah. He says, when men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists, who, is that right? That's not right. What, 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 what? Okay. Did I give you the wrong thing? Okay, they're just... Let me look and see, because that doesn't seem, no. Okay. Just blowing the whole thing. Well, anyway, the Lord was doing that. I think I did that. <laughs> the Lord's going, but anyway, Talks about the light of Messiah. Talks about uh, there's a light. A light will shine in the darkness. We it's the scriptures that we we uh, read at Christmas time. And if Diana, if you could find that for me, yes. To the law and to the testimony, they do not speak according to his word. They have no light of dawn. The people walking, there we go, there we go. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. They're talking about Messiah here. So the Israelites believed that Messiah was at the light of God. Is that as far as, yeah, that's as far as we went there. So the light of God, the light of life, the light of wisdom, the light of knowledge and spiritual 
connection with God. Similarly, as we said, he's the bread of life. What does that mean? There'll be no more hunger, spiritual hunger. You know that the people followed him around after the feeding of the 5,000. They wanted more food, but he was trying to teach them the spiritual food of God. He's the bread of life, and that in him there will be no more hunger. He's the living water. In him there'll be no more thirst. He told that to the lady at the well, and he told that to the group at the uh, Feast of the Tabernacles. Jesus really is the answer. We know, we've heard that before. It was really popular back in the 70s. That Jesus is the answer. In fact, there was even a song. Jesus is the answer for the world today. He's the light of the world. Jesus really is the answer. He's the answer to spiritual hunger. He's the answer, answer to spiritual thirst. He's the answer to spiritual blindness as the light of the world. So, his followers, who's that? Are there any of his followers in the room this morning? Okay? Okay, I thought so. We reflect his light, in a sense, to the world around us. But we're filled with his light. We're not the light, but we're filled with his light, and we reflect his light. Just like that beautiful picture this morning of the, of the moon reflecting the light of the sun. We reflect the glory of God. Because he's the light of the world. And with his followers, we can help light up the blindness or light up the world around us. As Jesus taught his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount, he explains his expectations for his kingdom and those of us who are within his kingdom. He said, you're the salt of the earth. But he also said, you are the light of the world. Not meaning that we are the light of God like Jesus is, but we, again, reflect that light. John, excuse me, Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's our job as his followers to reflect that glorious light of life. Light was an important symbol, as I said, of the Feast of the Tabernacles. During the feast, many emblems and ceremonies remembered the pillar of fire that gave light to the Israel during the Exodus as they went through the wilderness. Now Jesus took this important symbol and he simply applied it to himself. Just as the pillar of fire led God's people through the wilderness, I am the light of the world and I will lead people if they would look upon me. Just follow me. Look to me. And there's many out there who are blind and they can't see. They can't see his light. But it's our job to reflect that light to him. Or to them. Excuse me. Um, John 4, 1, 4 through 13 talks about John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist? He was uh, the one who was making the way for Messiah. And it says, in, in, starting with verse 4, said, in him was life... Speaking of Jesus, in him was life, and the light, or the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Is that blindness? There was a man sent from God whose name was John, the Baptist. And now, the Baptist was not his last name. De Baptist. No. Uh, John, and he, he, this man came as a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. And this, well, the reason I'm reading about John is because he started it and we need to continue this, what he did. We need to bear witness of the light so that all through us might believe uh, as they see the light. He was not that light, but he was to bear witness of the light. That, uh, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, speaking of the Jews, and they did not receive him. But as many believed in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So being born again, being a new creation, heading for heaven, basically, <clears throat> it only happens through the light of truth, the light of the world. So Jesus is the light. 
He's not the light to, to the Jews. That's not what he said. He didn't say, I am the light to the people of the United States of America. He didn't say that. He's the light of the world. Everyone, everywhere. And we, his followers, again, are so faithfully, are to faithfully and effectively reflect his light to the blindness of this world. How many believe that our world, when it comes to so many things, people are reaching out and seeking in the darkness. They're, they're grabbing at a cult over here. They're uh, maybe taking some drugs over there, maybe grabbing the bottle and forgetting all their cares with alcohol, whatever it is that they're doing. They're blind and they're stumbling. Just like I said at the beginning. They're bumping their shins on stuff. They're stepping on Legos. And God sent his son, Jesus, to be the light, to guide them. The blindness of the world. Let's look at verse 13 now. So Jesus just said, I am the light of the world. Whoever comes to me will have the light of life. Or the, yes, the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. Okay, so they immediately shut him down. Well, they thought they did, but they didn't. Oh, you can't, you can't talk about yourself. That's not, you know, what good is that? Anyone could say anything about themselves. That's, that's not valid. They were blinded to the one that they should have recognized. In reality, studying scripture all their lives, teaching the scripture all their lives, praying to God and going through all of that, they should have recognized Messiah, but they did not. There's a couple of words from the Hebrew that I want us to look at. The first word is Shekinah. You ever heard of Shekinah? Okay, uh, if you've been in the church a while, uh, people talk about, oh, we need the Shekinah glory of God to fill this place. Woo! You know, all that kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the word Shekinah is first encountered in the rabbinic literature. The Semitic, okay, we're not going to get into the techni technical stuff. But basically it means to settle or inhabit or to dwell. It refers to the dwelling of a person or an animal in a place, but it's most often used as the dwelling of God. Talks about his glory, his brightness, his light descending on and, and being in a place. Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. If you've been following us in our Bible reading, we read about the, it was a little bit tough this morning, I will admit it. Uh, we talked about all the details of building the tabernacle. I don't know if you saw that, but you know, the, you could build your own tabernacle now because all the, you know, the kind of cloth you use and how big it is and the poles and all that kind of thing. But it's very important. The tabernacle was very important. It's first mentioned in the Torah in Exodus 25 is the portable sanctuary that the Israelites carried with them in the wilderness. The Mishkan comes from the Hebrew word meaning to dwell. The tabernacle was considered to be the earthly dwelling place of God. In Exodus chapter 25, 8 and 9, God instructed Moses to tell the Israelites to build the Mikdash, or the sanctuary, where God may dwell, specifying exactly how the tabernacle should be designed. That's what the reading was this morning. I get this little article from myjewishlearning.com. So Shekinah Glory talks about his very presence in a place. They built the tabernacle so that God's very presence could be encountered as they traveled through the, through the wilderness. In fact, it was you could take it apart, pack it up, go some more, and then build it all out again. It was meant to be a, a temporary structure that, they could, that would move with them. On the other hand, there's another word called Ichabod. You ever heard that? Besides Ichabod praying. The, the Ichabod is a Jewish word, and it means the glory has departed. The glory has departed. Ichabod means without glory, or where is the glory? It's mentioned in the first book of Samuel uh, as the son of Phinehas. They called him Ichabod because at that time, the, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen from 
the Israelites taken into Philistine captivity. Now, Philistine is a Roman word meaning Palestine. Taken into the Philistine captivity. And so this, and then the, this uh, Phineas, who was the uh, son of Eli the priest, also died during this time. And so this lady had, her, his wife had their son, and she called him Ichabod, meaning the glory of God is gone. The glory of God has departed. Wow. I hope that you never get in a place, if you're young enough and you're still looking forward to kids, that whatever's happening in your life, that you don't tag that on your poor kid. Please don't do that. You know, that's, that's awful, but that's what that means. Glory has departed. And I believe that in this part, in this time, the glory had departed, basically, from the Israelites. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the priests, they were basically spiritually blind, and they should have been the light. They should have been reflecting the light of God. They challenged Jesus to his a witness of himself. They mentioned previously how, uh, or excuse me, as I mentioned before, in order to have a valid witness, you have to have two witnesses. Remember that? When they brought the lady caught in adultery, they needed to have at least two witnesses because that's what Jewish law stated. Well, they were looking at Jesus and saying, okay, you're saying all of this, but it's only you. That's not valid. You're, you're just one person. The Pharisees saw that only Jesus' testimony about himself. So basically, the light of the candles, which represented the light, had been absent for a thousand years. And now Jesus, who was the embodiment of God's glory standing before them, they were blind to it. Pride, idolatry, all kinds of sin caused the Shekinah to depart. Sadly, we see these things in churches today as well. Where's the glory? We need to pray that God would revive his people. Amen? You need to stay on course. I need to stay on course in my Christian walk. This is not a small thing. This isn't an optional thing. But this is the thing. We need to stick with God. Amen? We need to stay strong with him. Well, Jesus answers them. And he says, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I come from and where I'm going, but you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is, is true, for I'm not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one who bears witness of myself and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Okay, let's pause right there. So Jesus answers them. He says, I'm not alone here. I stand with the Father. He was qualified to bear witness of his testimony. He knew where he came from, and he knew what his destiny was. He knew why he had come to earth. They didn't know. They were blind to that. They judged by human standards, and he did not. Jesus' second point was that his testimony was not unsupported, but rather the Father was a second witness. Remember in uh, Matthew chapter 17, the disciples witnessed a glimpse of God's glory on Jesus when they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember in Jesus, all of a sudden he was bright. I mean, he says he's the light of the world, but at that point he was literally lighting up the place. And Moses and Elijah came, and he spoke with them. And the disciples actually got to witness that. Can you imagine what that would have been like to see the glory of Jesus? Well, I'm telling you, you will. You will. Stay on course, and you will. You'll see that glory of him. But the Father gave witness at that point. He said this, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. Well, the Pharisees' next question to Jesus was very telling. Verse 19 says, Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. 
and no one laid their hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Now they ask, where is your father? Well, they didn't see. They didn't know. Do you know that uh, a blind man, just someone who can't see, someone who's blind, that doesn't mean there isn't any light. That just means he can't see it. He can't sense it. There is light. And this is what's happening here. Jesus was the light. Their denying him wasn't making that less true or not true at all. He was the light, but they were blind and they couldn't see him. <clears throat> In our world, as I said before, people are reaching out. They're wanting the truth. They're wanting answers. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the light for their darkness and their blindness. Jesus is the satisfaction of their hunger as the bread of life. Jesus is the answer to their thirst. Drink of his, his living water and you'll never thirst again. Jesus is the light of the world. It's the light of the world in, in relation to his connection with the Father. His authority is not autonomous, but it's in perfect harmony with the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's the light of God. Light represents knowledge, wisdom, and something in the dark that, uh, something that those in the dark seem to naturally seek. If Jesus is the light, and he is, then they are seeking him, but they don't realize it. They're seeking him, and they don't realize it. Light is a revelation. Light reveals evil, but light reveals good as well. An early cancer diagnosis is bad news because the light of diagnosis has now revealed an evil in your body. There's a cancer. But it also reveals it, and there's hope. Amen? People are afraid to talk about sin. We just want, well, I don't want to offend anybody. But you know what? That light of diagnosis shines a light on that cancer of sin, and they can do something about it. Who's going to say, I need a Savior, who doesn't even know that they're in need of a Savior? They're not going to. The light will reveal that. So you put, you diagnose cancer. You catch it too late, means death, and it's not fixable. It's the same thing with sin. Revealed, it brings shame. However, it's still fixable. And there will come a day when it's not, when a person dies in their sin. Okay. So Jesus is the light of the world. The Pharisees were blind. We live in a world of blindness all around us, all around us. But we need to reflect his light. In Jewish history, as the Hebrews were in the wilderness after the captivity, again, as we've seen here, God instructed the people through Moses to build a tabernacle to travel with them, representing his presence with them. It would be the place of God's presence and God's Shekinah glory with them as they traveled. The tabernacle was used until the third king of Israel, who was Solomon, all the way through David. You know, that David also during David's time, they had the tabernacle. They didn't have a temple yet. They just had a tabernacle. But King Solomon got to build the first temple. And in both instances of the tabernacle in the wilderness and of Solomon's temple, the very first temple, talks about the glory of God coming and filling the tabernacle, coming and filling the temple. It was a glorious scene. Just go back and, and read about that. It was glorious. Eventually, that first temple was destroyed and a second temple was built. It was called Herod's Temple. It's the one that stood when Jesus walked the earth. There is absolutely no record of God's glory filling that temple. It was an empty shell of religion. It was an empty shell of just doing what we've always done. It was an empty shell. Why wasn't God's glory in that temple? Well, maybe because God's glory was just about to appear as Messiah, Jesus Christ, in the flesh. And he was there at the temple. 
but yet they rejected him. They didn't see it. They were blind to him. Two questions as we conclude this part this morning. We're going to take communion here in a bit. But two questions as we come to this conclusion. Here. Because I don't think that we come to church to say hi to a couple of people, drink some coffee, and uh, say, oh, that was a good message, and go home. But we need to let God do something in our heart. Amen? We need to take it with us. If we don't take it with us, then we don't, we don't have anything to shine. So we need to do it. So two questions I want you to ask yourself. I'm asking for a raise of hands. I'm not asking for anything. I'm just asking you to think about this. Have you been blind? But wait, Pastor, I'm a Christian. I'm not. But have you, have you maybe not blind, but as a Christian, have you let the thick fog of the world get in the way of your seeing Jesus? Or the second question is this. Have you been an effective light to those who are spiritual? Have you done what you know that God wants you to do to be an effective light to those around you? There might be a reason why not. And if so, then today I want us to, I want us to work on that. Before we take communion, I want us to pray. I want us to let God do the work in our hearts that needs to be done. Take away the fog, the blindness, and to rekindle the light of God within us. Let's pray. Lord, just thank you for this congregation. I thank you, Lord, for those who have joined us online. God, I pray that you would help us to be accurate reflections of the light of life, the light of Jesus to our world. Lord, some of us, maybe we have our... our sight has been obscured like a spiritual fog or cataracts or something and we're just not seeing Christ clearly. Lord, clear our eyesight, clear our hearts, Lord, that we might see you once again in all your glory. Help us to turn our eyes away from the world and to turn our eyes to you, Lord, as that song says. Turn our eyes upon Jesus and the things of the world will surely did. Lord, not that we ignore problems, but God, that we see you first. And Lord, we want to be effective lights for you. Lord, there are blind people, spiritually blind all around us. They might even reject us. They might reject the message because they can't see, just like the Pharisees rejected you on that day, Lord Jesus. Help us to stand strong and to shine the light of the world to them. Lord, they can see. Lord, we are your people, and we want to be about your business. We call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves your disciples. So, Lord, help us to be exactly that, wherever we are, wherever we go. So, Lord, forgive us for our blindness. Forgive us, Lord, for our lack of rightness. Help us, Lord, to live for you. That's been your prayer this morning. Let God change your heart. Give a hearty amen with me if you agree. Amen. All right. Wasn't sure if I was going to call people up to the altar or what, but I think that's what we're going to do. And now uh, we're going to go ahead and receive communion. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it's time to remember his blood and his body that was given for us. I have another. Okay. Come on up, Reuben. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Tell you, Reuben's got a testimony. Jesus shined his light bright in you, man. <laughs> so I want you to hold the elements as usual, and we'll partake of it together.
Jesus says, every time you do this, remember my body that was broken. Remember my blood that was shed for you. Together, hold it up. Again, this represents the broken body of Jesus. I think about the depictions that we've seen you know, in movies and things, and I'm sure that it's not even close to the suffering that Jesus actually suffered for you, for me. Horrendous. Not only physically, but his relationship with the Father was broken because our sin was that never happened before in all of eternity. Did that for you. Did that for you. The Father freely gave of His Son. It broke His heart to do that, but He did it for you. For me. So, Lord, as we hold this bread, we ask that you would bless it. All that it represents, Lord, we think about your broken body for us. Lord, we ask for healing on those who need healing in their bodies. Healing for those who need healing in their souls, in their emotions. So many people are depressed these days. Father, I pray that you would shine a light into that darkness of depression. For this wafer represents a broken body that brings healing. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, let's take it. And there's the cup. Representing the blood that was shed. I think I say every time, there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Well, couldn't God have done it differently? I suppose he could have, but this is how he did it. And this is what, what he came up with, and this is meaningful to us. And so without that, he couldn't be cleansed. But with it, we can be, be made whole. We can be made clean. Our sins are gone. No matter what it is that you did that you think, there's no way. They're gone. In Jesus' name, if you've given your heart and your life to him, if you've confessed your sins, they're gone. Amen? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for taking that sin of mine on you. It's horrible. God, you took it upon yourself, Lord Jesus, and you let your lifeblood flow into the dirt for me. And because of that sacrifice, I can be made clean. Because of that sacrifice, Lord, we have a place in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. In Jesus' name, we thank you for the cup. <clears throat> Reminds me, last uh, Sunday night, we had our hymn sing. We sang, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. We sang more than that, power in the blood and all those different ones. Or oh, good memories. We'll have to do that again. And if we do, I expect more folks to show up because it's a lot of fun. Well, anyway, well, God bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Go out, shine your light. Be aware of, of what the Holy, how the Holy Spirit's leading you in life, pray for people, encourage people. If you have issues and problems, you know, just say, well, you know, I can help this person, and I know God's got me covered. Or just ask somebody to pray for you, help carry the burden, amen? Let's just live together. All right, amen. Well, God bless you as you go.